All right, I have the handheld mic. This is open mic night at the comedy club, right? All right, we're gonna try that again. I don't know if it's ageism, if it's the gray hair. That was a pretty tepid response. So we're gonna try it again, okay? We're gonna act like I didn't do this. Hold on. And next up, John Greathouse. Wow. That's a fantastic response. It's wonderful to be here. We'll edit out the other part. All right, so I'm here to talk a little bit about, yeah, you don't need to go anywhere to be an entrepreneur. You guys are in a great place right here. You don't need me to tell you that. You have so much momentum with Catalyst, with the downtown project, with all the things that Zappos is doing. It's fantastic. So you're in, you're in a good place. Um, you know, I listen to the bio. Um, every time I listen to my bio, um, I kind of, um, let's, let's do the other presentation. Um, I, I kind of sit in the audience. I'm like, wow, that guy's impressive. I want to meet that guy. I'd like to be that guy. How the hell did he do that? Um, so one of the other things I want to um, sort of demystify is this idea that success happens to other people. It certainly doesn't. And I'm going to share with you some of my abject failures um, over, over the years um, that have resulted in, in um, some success. So here, you know, you can look at this and you say, yeah, wow, a couple IPOs, a couple of large transactions. A speaker here at Catalyst about a few weeks ago actually said, when you listen to someone's bio, you're just hearing their greatest hits, right? So it's like if you have a band that you really love, and if you really go deep into their catalog, you hear the demos, you hear the outtakes, some of it sucks, okay? <laughs> I'm a big Beatles fan, some of their demos really suck. Um, but if you just listen to the, like, you know, their greatest hits album, you think, these guys are infallible, this is incredible, this is awesome. So keep that in mind whenever you're seeing someone on stage, it's not, um, believe me, there's a lot of backstory there that they're, maybe they're not sharing with you publicly, but it ain't all good. And certainly, uh, my career is no exception. So a lot of people, or some people have heard of Go to Meeting, Go to My PC. That was a company we created from scratch, and we sold it to Citrix. I'm very proud of that company. Um, but there's another one I'm going to talk mostly about tonight. And part of being an entrepreneur, in my mind, is creating something for nothing. That's really all it means to me. So you can create something for nothing if you're a sole proprietor. You can create something for nothing if you work at a Fortune 500 company. It's, just, it's the concept of taking an idea and having that idea manifest in the real world and you making it happen. So if you look at that photo in the lower right-hand corner, it's kind of hard to figure out what that is. That was one of the very first robotic operating rooms. Computer motion brought robotics into the surgical arena. So not only do we create a company, not only do we create a product, we created a whole new market. I heard recently that in, in 2012, over 10,000 surgical robotic procedures were performed every single day. You know, that's upwards of 370,000 people that benefited from medical robotics. And so I'm, I'm proud that I played a very small part um, in, that, uh, in that legacy. So it's fun. So let's talk a little bit about how I got that done. The other thing I want to make sure you guys understand is entrepreneurs are not just the founders. You don't have to be Mark Zuckerberg and, and fly out to, uh, to uh, Silicon Valley and live that, live that lifestyle. I'm, I consider myself an entrepreneur. Um, I've helped create stuff from nothing, but I've only co-founded one company, and even that one, you could argue, my, my co-founder really did it. Um, but I was always a very, very early employee. In fact, I was the first business employee at a couple of these startups. So I'm talking to you guys. Maybe you're not the creative geniuses. Maybe you're not the engineers, but you're the business person that can come in and really turn those ideas into something profitable. So we'll talk about how I ended up landing a job at Computer Motion when I probably had no business doing so, and maybe a couple of those tips might pay off for you. So let's talk about how I got there. Well, before I do that, I want to share an anecdote with you that happened yesterday. I'm at the Ogden. I get in the elevator with my wife. We're going up. Somebody, you know, interrupts our trip up. They get on the elevator. It was Tony. I'm thinking to myself, wow, it's Tony at school. He's talking to somebody. I'm not going to interrupt him. I bet you my wife doesn't even know that's Tony, right? We're, you know, we're sitting there. We go up a couple more floors. We get off the elevator. Before I could say a word, we turn the corner, my wife turns to me, and she says, you have no idea who was on that elevator with us, do you? <laughs> and I kind of was like, I was smiling. I was like, wow, I underestimated my wife, you know. Shoot, she's been reading Tony's books. And so I, I couldn't answer. She didn't even give me a chance. She goes, you don't know who, who that was, do you? And I just kind of smiled, and she said, that was Nicolas Cage. <laughs> I thought she was punking me. I'm like, no, I don't think, I think that was Tony. Uh, 
You might look a little bit alike. I'm not really sure. And she goes, Tony? She's like, who's that? You know, she knows who Tony is. But she's like, no, no, the other guy. That was Nicolas Cage. And I said, no, I missed him. <laughs> but I didn't feel bad because I figured when I got off the elevator, they were probably like, you know who that was right behind us? That was John. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. So being, a, being an entrepreneur is a mindset, right? It really is a mindset. If you're not looking for Nick, you ain't gonna see Nick. I wasn't looking for Nick. You know, I knew Tony was you know, in the neighborhood, so when he walked in, I saw him. So it's really about what you have your eyes and ears open. That's what you're gonna see. So I want you guys to open your eyes, open your minds, open your hearts to that opportunity that's gonna fit with your passion and your abilities. Really, that's it. If you do that, you will be successful by definition. So let's get back to my story. So I'm in St. Louis, 1993. <laughs> Many of you were not born yet, which pisses me off. Um, that's okay. I didn't always have gray hair, it's all right. So in 1993, I'm in St. Louis. I have a house, we're living the Midwest dream, right? Eight month old baby, my wife's got a great job. I was working in a small company, but it was pretty solid. We quit our jobs, we sell our house, and just like the Beverly Hillbillies, we packed our bags and we, we went to Santa Barbara. We didn't go to Hollywood um, or Beverly Hills. And we went because a friend of the family contacted me and he said, I want to start a company. So this is 1993, Pre Starbucks was out there, but they weren't national. I want to start a company, we're gonna call it the California Coffee Company, do you want to run it? And I'm like, okay, I'm 30 years old, I'm looking for a startup that I can run. Sure, so not doing the research that I should have done, don't make this mistake, I go out to, to Santa Barbara. Really fun guy, a little too fun. First weekend, he goes, hey, I have a house in Beverly Hills, do you want to go down? I'm like okay, well, my wife's gonna be alone with the baby. Ah, sure, whatever. We go down to Beverly Hills, <laughs> right? You guys know, any of you that are married, you know what I was thinking, like, <laughs> this isn't gonna go over well, we just moved to California. So, and this is, this is the way this guy would roll. We pull up in his Rolls Royce, I'm not exaggerating. He would flip, it was like out of a bad movie. He would flip the car keys to the, to the valet. We would just ignore the long line and we'd walk right in. He would take his black Amex card, he would hand it to, you know, the person at the door. They would literally clear a table. I never understood that. Like, I'd be like, I'm not getting up, right? But there's a, there'd be a, a big table, and then all of a sudden, they would get up. We would sit down, and within 30 seconds, there'd be 30 people drinking his money. You know, women, and just, you know, sitting around. Laughing. He was the funniest guy in the club, right? So the first time, I was kind of like, wow, this is kind of cool, right? Lifestyles of someone else's money. I'm kind of digging this. You know, I'm not a big partier, and I'm faithful, faithful to my wife, but I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. So the second time I was like, uh, oh God, we did this, but it's different. I'm seeing celebrities and stuff, and I'm like, oh yeah, I can tell my wife about the celebrities I'm seeing. The third time it was getting old, but the fourth, fifth, and sixth time I was done with it. I felt bad for the people that were sitting with us. It was just like a bad scene, I wasn't into it. So 90 days in to the day, I walk into his office and I say, it's not happening. Like, you really just want to party. You've made a lot of money, and that's cool, but I haven't. <laughs> and I'm a lot younger than you, and I'm sort of ready to go do something else with my life. So I quit. No job, We're renting a very small condominium in Santa Barbara. I literally did not know anyone else in town at that point. So, the next, so I, so I do what any Red Bull American would do. <laughs> you think this is a joke? I sat on the couch and bawled. <laughs> my eyes out. My wife was sitting right next to me. And I'm like, I can't believe I did this to us. I'm such a failure. I'm an idiot. I'm just going on and on and on. And um, like Mike had mentioned in his talk, I moved all over as a kid too. But I'd never been to California. I wanted to be in California so bad and I blew it, right? My one chance. And she gave me one shot and I blew it. So we're sitting there and I said, oh, you know, well, I guess we'll just move back to Washington, D.C. Because that's kind of where we're from. That's where my wife's from. And I'm kind of, I remember, I'll never forget it. I was kind of looking this way. My wife was over here. I'm just like, <laughs> and she goes, no. And I'm like, no, you don't love me? Like, what? <laughs> what do you mean, no? And she's like, no, we're not going back to DC. It's October, it's Santa Barbara, the winters are awesome here. We're gonna stay, we're gonna stay through the winter. If we don't have jobs, we'll, go, we'll figure it out. We'll go back if we want, we'll, we'll just don't worry about it. I wish I could bottle that feeling that I had at that moment, elation. Elation. So I felt like a Mack truck had been picked up off my chest. I'm not kidding you. That's why I say I wish I could bottle that. But what was funny in retrospect was I went from like sobbing, crying, 
you know, tears of, of sorrow to sobbing, crying, tears of joy. I was like, no, really? Are you kidding? Can we stay? It's awesome. I love you. <laughs> She's here. She can tell you that is a true, a very true story. So the next day, literally the next day, I, I, I meet with this lawyer, um, and I'm trying to get out of the coffee company thing. just wanted to make sure all the legal, uh, everything was tied up. And so I'm talking to him about that. At the end of the conversation, he goes, hey, you know, what are you going to do? I'm like, I don't know. Probably just move back to the East Coast. I'm not sure. He goes, well, well, here, there's this guy out at UCSB, Dr. Yulin Wong, and he's doing some really cool stuff with robotics. You should probably check it out. And I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever. I put the phone number in my pocket, totally forgot about it. A week later, I'm at my desk, and I found this piece of paper, and I couldn't remember at first what it was. I looked at it. I'm like, oh, that's I got UCSB. Crumpled it up. Literally crumpled it up. Started to throw it away. Could not throw it away. Could, it wouldn't leave my hand. I was like, eh, what's going on here? I smoothed it out. And then I started looking at it, and I felt like a 13-year-old boy that was calling his first girl. I was like, well, what, what am I going to say? Like, he's going to think I'm an idiot. And what if he asked me this, and I don't know? Um, you know, I don't know what, uh, I, I can't do this. I kind of expected, you know, uh, an elderly Asian man, somebody, whoops, somebody, somebody that um, <laughs> was sort of bent over and would be like, robotics. And I'd be like, what? I don't know. And, and, <laughs> Okay, I just felt intimidated by it, right? So I figured I better do some research in this guy. So I went to the library, and for you guys, that's a, a big building with books. Yeah, seriously. Um, and then I even went into the stacks. I know you don't know what that is, I'm not even gonna explain it. I went into the stacks and I found this guy's PhD, his dissertation, I read it, I read his dissertation. I understood very little of it, but I read enough of it to understand kind of what he was talking about. 10 years later, Yulin said to me, John, my advisor, my mom, and you are the only three people on the planet that read my dissertation. <laughs> he remembered 10 years later, so be different. When I was able to sit down with him and say, hey, you know, I read your dissertation. I'm not gonna profess to understand it, but you know, I had some interesting comments to make, which he didn't laugh at too hard. So that worked. So I'm sitting there and he's like, I don't know what you could do. I don't really know what a CFO would do. I don't really know what a finance person would do. Hey, but there's a woman coming in today to sign a telephone contract. Can you look at it? So I looked at it, $30,000 for eight engineers' phone system. Does that sound out of whack, 93? I'm like, oh, wow, this is crazy. I didn't even work there yet. He goes, well, can you talk to her? And I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll talk to her. She comes in, she's like, you know, big hair, big shoulder pads, big makeup. She's ready <laughs> to cash that commission check, you know? I sit down with her, I'm like, I don't think we need this, this or this. I cut 15K out of it, which was still too much, but I saved about $15,000. Yulin kind of looks around the corner, he's like, is she gone? I'm like, yeah, she's gone, so it's okay. He comes in, he goes, well, what happened? And I'm like, well, I, I got it down to 15. It's probably still too much, but you know, we're pretty far down the road. She's ordered some stuff, so let's just go ahead and do it. Hadn't, it didn't even work there. And I helped save $15,000 in 1993. So Yulon said, yeah, I'm not really sure what you can do, but we'll probably, we'll, you know, let's see if we can find something else. Seven and a half years later, that was the running joke. I just kept finding things to do. So add value before you get paid. <coughs> Focus on equity. My wife, remember that conversation on the couch around bawling? She got a job right away. She's a CPA, she got a job at the biggest accounting firm in, in Santa Barbara. Boom, she's got some money coming in, we're not gonna starve. Yulin comes to me and says, what do you wanna get paid? I'm like, I don't, I, you, you tell me. You pay me what you think is fair. He's like, oh, I don't know. I mean, I ain't gone to Wharton. When I went to Wharton, kids graduated, got 100K. And I'm like, I know I wasn't gonna get that. So he gives me a paltry salary, no problem. I said, hey, how about equity? I really want equity in this company. I believe in this company. I think equity's where it's at. So he gave me a paltry amount of equity. Six weeks later, the chairman came into my office and he said, you are killing it. And he, um, I think he tripled my equity at that point. So again, deliver, focus on equity if you can afford it. Um, and the other thing you wanna do, you'll read this in all the books, you have to not only wear multiple hats, <laughs> you need to go in knowing what those multiple hats are. So I used to trick people because they thought I was a CFO. I'm a sales guy. So I could just like do some mind tricks on them, right? They're like, well, he's a CFO. I'm not gonna buy anything. Oh, and then they start signing agreements. I was, it was stealth sales, it was awesome. But those were the multiple hats I could wear. I could walk in and be a CFO and I could, which I was a lousy CFO to be frank, um, and, but I was a pretty good salesperson. So know what multiple hats you can wear. Put your money where your mouth is. If you can afford it, invest some money in your new venture. If you really wanna put three to five years of your life into a company, couldn't you wanna put a little bit of money too? Even if you can't, even if your you know, founder goes, I can't, we don't have a funding round open, they will be impressed if you say, look, I don't have a lot of dough, but I want to put some of it in this thing because I believe in it. So put your money where your mouth is. Only put in what you can afford to lose. And lastly, 
get infected, show that you're infected. Don't go to an interview with your arms crossed like, you sell me on this. Go in there. I'm talking about startups now, right? I'm talking about an adventure, not a job. You're looking for an adventure. You better know what that company does. You better be a user, if it's possible to be a user of their product. Go to my PC, go to a meeting, free trial, 30 days. I would still interview people, and I'd say, what do you think about the product? I haven't had a chance to use it yet. Done. You know, I feel like just going, okay, you know, we got to roll. Because you haven't even used the product, it's free. Other people would come in and go, oh, I've been using it for years, I've been using it for months, I helped my mom do tech support with it, it's awesome. So let's say you have a product like medical robots and you can't be a user, hopefully. <laughs> You're not gonna become a surgeon overnight. So what you do is become an ev evangelist. Start blogging about it, start tweeting about it, follow the founders and the CEO on Twitter. Start getting involved so that when you have your interview, you can say, hey look, I, I, I know your company, are you kidding me? This is what I've already done on your behalf. So in closing, remember the elevator. It's all about what's up here. It doesn't matter whether you see Tony, right? Or Nick, or both of them. But don't be that person that stands there in the elevator, stares at their shoes, and doesn't see anybody that walks in. Thank you.